So hello everyone and welcome to the third day of NAM and the fifth plenary of the week. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Owen Carley as today's morning plenary speaker. Um, Dr. Carley uh, completed his PhD in 2014 and at this stage he's already an established, established a prime role for himself in the field of particle acceleration and eruptions in the solar atmosphere, focusing in recent years uh, on radio observations of plasma emission from the sun. He was awarded in the same year that he completed his PhD, a prestigious Irish Research Council Elevate Fellowship, co-funded by the Marie Curie Actions. And this took him, and here goes, I'm going to be brave, to the Laboratoire d'Etudes Spatiales et d'Instrumentation en Astrophysique. Hopefully that was understandable at the Paris Observatory. I don't know how your pronunciation and, and French is, so, and maybe you can correct me later on. Now, during this time in Paris at the LESIA, he worked on the radio signatures of particle acceleration in the solar atmosphere using the NANSE radio heliograph and the NANSE dec uh, decimetric array. More recently, in 2019, Dr. Carley was awarded the Schrodinger Fellowship uh, to undertake five years of research in where he is currently at in the astronomy and astrophysics section of the Dublin Institute for Advanced uh, Studies. The current focus of his research is in using the Irish Low Frequency Array, the ILOFAR, and the International LOFAR Telescope to observe eruptions, shock waves, and intense bursts of plasma emission in the solar atmosphere. So um, this is the topic now of his plenary talk today. And at this stage, I will hand over to Dr. Carly Tellers about the shocking radio sun observations of solar eruptive events in the new era of radio interferometry. Over to you, um, Owen. Okay. Um... Just to make sure when I share my slides, you can see these. That is looking good, yes. Great, okay, thank you for the nice introduction. I won't attempt to repronounce uh, the French pronunciation of Lessia. I think it was fine. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the, the organizing committee for the opportunity to provide a talk here today. It's a pleasure. Um, my name is Owen Carley. Um, I'm a Schrodinger Research Fellow in the Astronomy and Astrophysics section of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And I am a low frequency solar radio astronomer. So in a nutshell, I use some of the largest low frequency radio telescopes in the world to study some of the largest eruptions in the solar system. And in particular, I use uh, an advanced system known as LOFAR or the low frequency array. Some of the images of which you may be able to see in my background slide here. Um, and LOFAR is a very modern piece of radio observing technology. It's the state of the art in low frequency radio studies of the universe. So what I hope to describe over the next 40 minutes or so is the solar radio phenomena or the solar phenomena in general that I'm interested in, how we use an advanced instrument like LOFAR to study them. Before that, I'll talk a little bit about the history of solar radio observations. And then I'll move on to, you know, what the future holds for radio observations of the sun, uh, eruptive activity on the sun and space weather in general. Okay, so let's get started with the phenomena I'm interested in. So I study coronal mass ejections, solar flares, I guess collectively known as solar eruptive events. So what are CMEs? CMEs are large eruptions of plasma and magnetic field from the low solar corona into the heliosphere. They carry with them around 10 to the 12 typically kilograms of plasma, travel at velocities of hundreds to thousands of kilometers per second. Uh, giving them energies of up to 10 to the 25 joules, making them pretty much the most explosive or energetic explosive events in the solar system. They're usually observed in white light coronagraphs, such as the uh, movie you can see here. Hopefully that, that's playing well enough for you. Um, uh, the example I show here is from the Stereo B Core 1 coronagraph showing a pretty spectacular solar eruption. Uh, their nascent structure or the, the early stage evolution of these things can also be imaged in the extreme ultraviolet. For example, we see here a 304 angstrom uh, image in e from the EVI instrument on stereo B. And the study of CMEs and flares in and of themselves, um, you know, there's a, a variety of open questions, you know, why they become unstable, why they erupt and how they propagate into the heliosphere. But there's a whole host of different types of activity that you know occur alongside all of this uh, eruptive activity that I'm pretty interested in. So while we have our large scale eruption, you know, imaged in white light or in the EUV, at the same time, we have a whole variety of electromagnetic emissions that take place during an eruptive event. So I show here just the general, you know, increases in flux and how they appear, you know, throughout the event over time. So for the largest of events, 
we'll see an increase in gamma rays. Um, we'll see an increase in hard and soft X-rays, and that's usually how we classify the solar flare itself. In the radio domain, we see uh, microwaves well correlated with the hard X-rays. We see meter waves, decameter waves, even longer wavelengths still from uh, space-based observatories, which I'll talk about as well. Um, some tens of minutes after one of these eruptive events in situ, you know, at spacecraft at various points in the heliosphere, uh, most likely at, at L1 on front of the Earth, um, we'll have the arrival of energetic particles in the form of electrons, protons, heavier ions, ranging in energies all the way from KeV up to GeV. And just a, a nice illustration of this I always like to show is uh, these are the Lasco C2 and C3 coronagraphs at Lagrangian point one. And they're basically meant to be observing CME eruptions, but every so often we'll see the CCD detector be absolutely blasted by energetic particles um, as they arrive at the spacecraft at L1. Hopefully that you can see that there. It's just a dramatic illustration of the arrival of so many energetic particles at the Earth in the after aftermath of one of these eruptions. Of course, it's noise in a CCD detector. We actually have genuine particle detectors to observe you know, their species, their energy, um, uh, and so on. Okay, so what am I interested in answering? So pretty much how we get from the left picture to the right picture, you know, what is it about eruptive events in the solar corona that accelerates a lot of energetic particles and, you know, what causes their eventual propagation into the heliosphere where they will arrive in situ at spacecraft um, where they're detected by particle detectors. Okay, so I'm interested in looking at the early stage evolution of um, eruptive events on the sun and you know how we can monitor particle acceleration and is there a means of doing this and as i'll show uh, radio is often the best means of doing this it's important to remind ourselves why on a practical level so in a, in, in a sense of studying the sun for for its own sake to study it as a star that's the reason why we're interested we want to you know figure out why there are these eruptions how particles are accelerated but on the practical level, there is a whole variety of adverse effects on Earth's technological infrastructure, you know, that we need to look out for. For example, uh, the arrival of the CME itself can cause a geomagnetic storm, which can induce currents in power grid systems and oil and gas pipelines. Uh, the arrival of particles uh, can uh, cause radiation damage and damage to satellite electronics. They can even, even cause a radiation hazard to astronauts um, on the space station, for example, or even the crew and passengers of uh, commercial flights close to the Earth's poles. The ionosphere can be perturbed, you know, interrupting radio communication, particularly high frequency communication on the ground, you know, that uses the ionosphere for its propagation. Uh, there can be interruptions to GPS and all of the navigation systems that rely on GPS. So there is a real need to be able to understand you know, when the sun will erupt, uh, if it will cause adverse space weather activity, and of course, if we can forecast all of that activity. And this whole, uh, this whole study is known, of course, as space weather. Okay, so in, in, in trying to figure out, you know, how the sun erupts and how it accelerates its particles and how they ex escape into the heliosphere, I mentioned that radio is often the best way of getting at um, those characteristics. And in order to describe this, I need to describe, you know, what is our standard picture of what we think is going on um, during an eruptive event. Okay, so um, the release of energy via magnetic reconnection is basically known as the solar flare. It accelerates particles, all of the electromagnetic uh, emissions from which I, I showed a couple of slides back. Now, these particles may find themselves on open magnetic fields where they propagate uh, far into the heliosphere, okay? Among these particles, the electrons are really good at inducing uh, a coherent emission known as plasma emission, so very intense, uh, coherent, non-thermal radio emission. And they do so at the local plasma frequency. So, for example, the plasma frequency is pretty much just related to the electron density. As they escape further into the corona, uh, the electron density drops and they emit lower and lower frequency over time. The result of all this is if we uh, plot inverse frequency here over time, we have this type, what we call a type three radio burst. So it shows a, a swoop towards low frequencies over time. So this, this, this is characteristic, this characteristic shape here signifies electron escape far into the heliosphere. Now, at the same time, uh, we may have a CME that erupts into the corona, and a CME 
uh, is a flux rope. This flux rope um, may travel faster than the, the local magnetosonic speed in the corona. If it does so, it will drive a shock. And like all shocks in astrophysical plasmas, it's pretty good at accelerating particles. Now, amongst these, again, it's the electrons, of course, that uh, induce plasma emission. And we monitor this in terms of a dynamic spectra of inverse frequency versus time. And this is called a type two radio burst. So it again shows a slow drift towards lower frequencies over time, pretty much because that shock is reaching larger altitude. It's encountering lower densities and emitting at lower frequencies over time. So by studying you know, the time evolution of these radio bursts, we can actually tell an awful lot about the physics going on in the corona. So from, from the evolution of type threes, we can tell about particle escape almost from you know, their point of acceleration all the way to L1. I think radio is the only domain of observation that will actually offer you that. Um, in the type two radio bursts, we can tell things about you know, the shock kinematics, its speed, sometimes things about its compression ratio, its Mach number. And when we zoom in, as I'll show later on, we can actually see features that are tied to the plasma instabilities that cause the radio emission and the particle acceleration itself. So there's a whole variety, or it's a lucrative source of information to study these radio bursts to get back at the particle acceleration features of eruptive activity in the solar corona. Now, the real power of these observations is, is of course, in, in looking at them in dynamic spectra or spectroscopically, but what we want to be able to do is image these things, you know, image the where, when, and how uh, you get these radio bursts and particle acceleration in, you know, the early phases to the late phases of eruption. And to do this, we, of course, need interferometers. And before I describe, uh, you know, how we do it in the modern day, I just want to go back and talk a little bit about solar radio research history because it's quite a long one, and it almost dates back to the, you know, the inception of radio astronomy itself. So, and, and indeed, in terms of studying eruptive activity, I believe, so, you know, radio ob observations of the sun are one of the first means of providing access to that eruptive activity. In fact, it predates things like observing CMEs and white light and everything. It dates back to basically the 1940s and 50s. Okay, so radio astronomy itself got going in the early 1930s with Carl Jansky's first observation of radio emission from the Milky Way. Um, about a decade after this, the first radio burst observations were observed under secrecy using uh, British military radar. They actually thought it was radar jamming at the time, but that was pretty much the first radio burst observed in 1942. Um, the radio burst that we all, you know, as radio astronomers know and love today, started to be observed uh, in the late 1940s, and the first one of which, or the first type two radio burst, I believe was uh, from an Australian radio astronomer known as Ruby Payne Scott, who observed the first type two in you know, a very simple way. She just had three um, uh, frequencies here, 200 megahertz to 60 megahertz, and looked at the delay in time of arrival of radio flux from the sun and from this deduced that there was something leaving the sun at high speed of up to 750 kilometers per second, which is pretty remarkable because the analysis she did is pretty much how we do it today and it's still accurate today. And it predates, as I said, the regular observation of coronal mass ejections uh, in white light, which really only got started in the 1970s. Okay, in the 1950s, you know, the first kind of spectrographs were built uh, offering how we, you know, or basically the first means of observing radio bursts from the sun as we observe them today in frequency versus time, showing this nice type two radio burst completely uh, the same and analogous, and analogous to what I showed with the modern instrumentation a few slides back. Now, the modern way in which we observe radio bursts on the sun really only got started in the late 60s to the 70s uh, with the construction of dedicated radio interferometers uh, known as radio heliographs. So this is the non-say radio heliograph. If you're a solar radio astronomer, you know, you hold this close to your heart because it's, it's, it's basically been going for the last 50 years and providing some excellent observations of the solar atmosphere. So it's located in Nancy in central France, about a two hour drive south of Paris in a pretty radio quiet region. It's a dedicated solar interferometer, a T-shaped interferometer consisting of several dishes, and it observes in 10 discrete frequencies uh, from 150 to 450 megahertz. And just, you can see some nice images of the quiet sun here. 
And the way in which we use Nancé, you know, over all the decades since it was built, is to pretty much combine, you know, the radio observations of the quiet and active sun with all of the space-based observational uh, arsenal that we have these days, you know, that really got going uh, past the 80s and 90s. So, for example, the coronagraphs that were launched on Soho in 1995, which are still going, you know, could be combined with Nancé to to provide a, a holistic view from white light to radio of eruptive activity. Uh, X-ray imagers such as RESI, which has sadly uh, been decommissioned recently, provided you know, a combination of X-ray and radio instruments. And recently launched the Solar Dynamics Observatory is an EUV imager of the sun, and I'll show a few examples of that. Uh, in the 2010s is providing you know, spectacular coverage of the early stage evolution of solar eruptive events in combination with NOSE, which provides you know, access to where all the particle acceleration is going on. And it's been providing you know, combinations of radio and white light and EUV for the past number of decades, and only recently pre pretty much been replaced by instruments such as LOFAR, which I'll talk about later in the, in the uh, 2010s. So for the moment, I'll just provide a couple of examples of how we actually observe radio bursts in imaging in combination you know, with space-based observations of eruptive activity on the sun. So on the left here, I show um, an EUV image of the sun from the solar NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. This is the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly. And it's a three color image in which we combine, you know, three different EUV filters, two 111 angstroms, 193 and 171 angstroms. They pr pretty much provide access to different temperature plasma in the solar corona. So changes in color, as you may see, is uh, an indication of different temperature plasma becoming more or less dense, or it changes in temperature as well. And what do we see? We see eruptive activity here on, on the east limb of the sun. It's pretty spectacular. It propagates, or we see these large scale structures propagating you know, to the North Pole, to the South Pole over time. And what these are are pretty much large scale MHD disturbances propagating through the corona pretty much an EUV indication of a shockwave um, in response to energy release and eruptive activity um, from the low solar corona into the heliosphere. Now, the real key is in combining radio imaging with this activity. So while EUV provides you images at nice time resolution of that shock, the radio domain provides you of the where and when electrons are accelerated in response to that eruptive activity. So what do we see here? We see an eruption, uh, the same eruption observed in white light here. We see one of the EUV filters here in the blue shading. Um, and these radio sources are from the non radio heliograph. Okay, so these are non-thermal radio sources, pretty much an indicator of where all that particle acceleration is taking place. Um, it's taking place close to the active region, and in this case, on the CME flank, uh, pretty much close to where we see that shock or that MHD disturbance uh, in the EUV domain. So again, while EUV gives you access to shocks, radio imaging gives you access to the sites of electron acceleration, which gets us close to how they're accelerated and how they escape into the corona. Okay, so the interpretation at the time, this is a, a publication from myself back in 2013, is that we have a CME erupting into the corona, and it drives a shock on its flank, and electrons are accelerated onto open field, where they escape on their journey into the heliosphere. Sometimes you see those radio bursts at the CME nose, and generally the NOSI radio heliograph was pretty good, or is pretty good, at providing a few frequencies, um, discrete frequencies of where and when these radio bursts take place, okay? But it does have a few shortcomings, and this is in the fact that it's not a full imaging spectrometer, meaning we only have discrete frequencies, okay? In this case, I could only image at 150 megahertz. What we want to be able to do is image in our radio burst any frequency at any time at very high time resolution. In other words, we need full imaging spectroscopy in the radio domain. And that has only recently been, become available uh, recently with the advent of uh, new technology such as the low frequency array. So this is what I show here. So this is uh, low far the low frequency array. It is a phased array interferometer operating between 10 and 240 megahertz. It consists of 50 stations across eight European countries and counting. Uh, these include a station that we have at Burr Castle in Ireland, as I will show that. 
um, a station in the UK, in France, in, um, in Germany, there's a few. Uh, there's a central hub in the Netherlands, Sweden, Latvia, uh, three in Poland, and a newly built station in Lofar, Italy, in Medicina. So this is not yet operational, but will be, I guess, in the coming years. Now, uh, LOFAR is not a solar dedicated instrument. It has many key science projects. It's observed to, or it's used to observe many things, such as the epoch of reionization, uh, low frequency surveys, pulsars and transients, AGN, so a whole variety of things. Uh, we have the solar and space weather key science project that's headed up by Pietro Zucca and myself. Um, fun fact about LOFAR is that it generates seven petabytes of data per year which is bigger than the daily, or sorry, the, the yearly accrual of data of Twitter and Spotify combined. So this really is a huge data science project. It's a challenge in data storage. It's a challenge in data processing. And it has a few uh, machine learning applications thrown in there as well. And it is a pathfinder to the huge data challenges that will become available uh, or will, uh, become, will come down the line with the square kilometer array um, at the end of this decade. Okay, so all stations send their data via fiber optic link to a central hub in the Netherlands where they're correlated uh, in, a, in this odd looking building here. Uh, but what does a single station actually look like? So this is the Irish Low Frequency Array or ILOFAR, our single station that we have in Burr Castle. It's pretty much a field of antennas. It's about the size of a football field and it consists of two types of antennas. What we have here, uh, the high band array, uh, which uh, see from two, 110 to 240 megahertz, and the low band array, which see from 20 to 90 megahertz. And the key thing about LOFAR is it is really simple technology at the front end, in, uh, at the antennas. And when I say simple, I mean simple. For example, the, the LBA um, antennas are pretty much cross dipole wires above a metal grid that's just a ground plane. And this grid is just pretty much the same as you would find in reinforced concrete, actually. Uh, these feed their signal into a, a small preamp at the top here. And this preamp uh, feeds its signal via coax cable into the brains of the operation, which is inside this large container here. So while we have very simple technology in the front end, the back end is where it gets complicated. So inside here, we have um, hundreds of receivers and beamforming technology. And by beamforming, I mean what it does is supply phase delays to different antennas across the field such that you digitally steer your telescope beam in different directions on the sky, uh, meaning there is, no moving far there is no moving parts. It just it provides a beam at any point on the sky digitally, and it can do this uh, hundreds of times at once, as I can show. So we can observe many things at once with a system such as this. So ILOFAR consists, or the consortium consists of many universities in, in Ireland. In fact, we have four institutes in Dublin, one in Galway, one in Cork. Uh, we have the Athlone Institute of Technology and Armagh Observatory in Northern Ireland. So it's kind of a, um, a north-south collaboration. So a whole island of Ireland collaboration that keeps this thing running and, and you know, observing it in single station mode as well as using it in the international array. As a brief aside here, um, I'd just like to point out the location of our Irish station, the location of ILOFAR. It's in the Midlands of Ireland in a, a small town called Burr, uh, on, on the site of Burr Castle, which you can see down the bottom here. So this is actually a privately owned castle uh, of the Parsons family, who are still there and have been there since, I believe, the 17th century. Um, and it has a long, or this site has a long tradition in astronomical observing, for example, uh, the third Earl of Ross, who was part of the Parsons family, uh, built this, this telescope in the 1840s. This is known as the Leviathan, and it, it's, it's a, an optical telescope. Obviously, it's uh, two meters in diameter. It's 10 meters long, and it's a, it's a Newtonian type of telescope um, housed in this, um, in this, in this uh, stone structure here. So the third Earl of Ross in the 18th century pretty much used this to resolve for the first time the spiral nature of galaxies. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy, one of his drawings dating back to 1845. So he was able to resolve uh, the spiral structure using this, this enormous telescope back in 1845. And it was the largest telescope in the world um, up until I believe uh, 1916 when Mount Wilson uh, Observatory was built in California. So it was, it was actually 
you know, state-of-the-art technology for its day back in the 19th century. And I always like to show this comparison. So this is one of Lord Ross's sketches from 1845 of the Whirlpool Galaxy using his Leviathan telescope and just comparing that to, you know, state-of-the-art state technology of today in LOFAR HBA of the same object. So you can see he did a he did a pretty good job if we can if we compare what was you know 19th century observing technology to 21st century observing um, technology. It's pretty good. Okay, so enough about single stations and our the location of our ILOFAR sites. You know, how do we use LOFAR to observe the sun? Well, LOFAR is an interferometer. Um, it produces interferometric images of the sun by you know correlation of all stations across the array at that central hub in the Netherlands. Um, we use it to observe both quiet and active solar phenomena, one example of which I'll show here. So this is an image of the quiet sun, but it's pretty uh, special. It's an image of the quiet sun at 140 to 160 megahertz, and it's during uh, an eclipse on 2015, March 21. So if I play this movie here, hopefully you can see that this is an eclipse in the radio domain, which is pretty special to be able to observe. So hopefully you will see uh, the ingress and egress of the moon as it passes by the sun during this past, uh, during this um, partial solar eclipse. So I'll let it play again. I think this is a fantastic movie and uh, just a good illustration of um, how we use LOFAR to uh, image the sun in the radio domain. If you'd like to find out more about this, this was published in Ryan et al. in 2021, in which we actually used the limb of the moon provide better spatial resolution than would normally be available, you know, just using the stations alone. In fact, we use the moon in a sense as an interferometer in and of itself. Okay, so LOFAR does provide excellent interferometric images of the solar corona and all activity in the solar corona. But I'd like to move on to a slightly different kind of imaging technology that we use, and this utilizes the fact that LOFAR is a beamformer, okay? So what we do is we take all of the stations in the Netherlands, okay, there's about 36 of them, and we, we produce what we call a tide array beam imaging of the sun. So what's tide array beam imaging? So I mentioned we have the ability to supply any number of phase delays across the array that we want, meaning we can produce almost any number of digital beams in this telescope in any different direction that we want. And um, our, you know, the number of digital beams is pretty much only limited by computational capacity. So, for example, this is just an illustration of the LOFAR core stations. One could have a very narrow beam of the telescope pointed in this direction, and at the same time in in this direction, or here or here. Okay, meaning you can observe many different objects at once if that's if that's the observational if that's your observational priority. On the other hand, what we can do is we can take hundreds of station beams and arrange them in a honeycomb pattern around our target source, in our case, the sun. So basically, what does this offer you? So this offers you hundreds of different um, and independent dynamic spectra in each of these beams over time, okay? Now, the key thing, the key fact here it, is it offers you extremely high time resolution dynamic spectra at 200 points around your around your target source, um, providing, I think, the fastest imaging spectroscopy available in the radio domain, or if not in general, in observing the sun. So it can be, depending on your frequency resolution, as fast as five microseconds, which is you know really fast for imaging technology for observing the sun. So what happens when we point it at the sun, this kind of observing um, mode? So um, this is just an example from a pretty famous eruptive event from 2017, September 10. What do we see in our atmospheric imaging assembly? Again, in the EUV domain, we had this really beautiful event that actually pretty much looked like the standard model of eruptions. This is a plasmoid uh, viewed pretty much uh, cross section on that you can see here uh, in the radio domain. In LOFAR, in a dynamic spectrum, uh, we were observing from, say, 30 to 55 megahertz. And over 40 seconds of observation here, what I, ha what I have is a type 2 radio burst observed with extremely good time resolution. And the extremely good time resolution, as I said before, allows us to dig in deep into the fine structure of these radio bursts and see specific signatures of particle acceleration features over time as this shock is propagating through the corona. 
Now, the key thing here is that we have full imaging spectroscopy, unlike the non say radio heliograph, which only uh, you know, offered you discrete frequencies in your observing range. Here, we can image any frequency we want at any time we want at extremely high time and frequency resolution. The only burden is that in 40 seconds of data, we have 12 million images to, cho to choose from. So it's a fantastic data set to have, but also a burden, you know, computationally and in terms of how we process all that data um, um, at the same time. Okay, so initially we take it easy. We just uh, um, image a few discrete frequencies here um, in these radio bursts. And we see the same thing as before, okay? So we have in the EUV and white light domain, we see eruptive activity on the sun and we have a nice radio burst at the, at the CME front here, likely indicator of a shock. And this time we have a number of frequencies uh, being able to be observed, uh, showing where particles are escaping into the corona at the flank of that CME. The ability to observe at multiple frequencies, you know, at once means we can produce nice models of this scenario. This is what I've modeled here in uh, this paper from Diana Morrison in Nature Astronomy in 2019. So what were we able to do? We were able to uh, reconstruct this, the, the coronal magnetic field, the Alphane speed environment, the shock bubble itself, and the position of the radio sources um, in amongst that magnetic field and Alphane speed environment, offering you a huge amount of new information on how all of these processes uh, take place. What we're able to get at is, you know, we have bursty electron acceleration, um, beam energies up to 34 keV. We were able to get at shock Mach numbers. We we're able to get at shock geometries using this three-dimensional model, uh, which is um, in this case was quasi-perpendicular, which is a real indicator of you know the kind of acceleration mechanisms that are taking place during this eruptive process. In this case, it's shock drift acceleration. And this is pretty much how it's done in the modern day. Okay, so there are a number of studies of this kind. You know, what we're able to do is model the eruption itself, um, model how strong the shock is, embed this in magnetic fields, look at the position of radio sources in LOFAR, and see, you know, where, when, and how that electron acceleration took place and potentially how it escaped into the corona. This is, can also be done from uh, space-based observing radio, radio observing platforms in which they model a nice eruption of a CME using a GCS model here and triangulated the radio sources um, um, with respect to that CME as they propagated into the heliosphere. So this just gives you a flavor of the kind of um, observational um, or modeling efforts we have nowadays in trying to understand the shock particle acceleration phenomena uh, phenomenon in the corona. But we don't only look at shocks, we look at all sorts of different kinds of things like particle beam escape into the corona, you know, signified by type three radio bursts. We look at fine scale features in dynamic spectra, which LOFAR provides us access to. For example, this is a nice uh, paper from Contar et al in 2017, in which they looked at fine scale structure known as striae in type three radio bursts and comparing, you know, the size of striae and what we should see uh, in imaging to how they appear in images and um, we can tell all sorts of things like how radio waves are scattered in the corona and this provides us access to things like density turbulence it basically provides a new probe of density turbulence in the corona and gets us at some really fundamental plasma parameters and the fundamental means by which uh, beams generate radio emission how they scatter in the corona and um, the, the nature of turbulence itself in the corona in fact, studying scattering in this way um, is part of the reason why we lose small scale structure when we move to the, to the low frequency domain in, in the radio. So what I show here is several images in the radio domain ranging from 17 gigahertz all the way to 80 megahertz. So you can see at 17 gigahertz in the Nobuyama radio heliograph, we image the chromosphere and we see some you know, nice small scale features. We see prominences, filaments, um, maybe some plage regions as well. As we move into the lower frequency domains, we go into the corona and start to lose that small scale structure. And at lower frequencies uh, still in 80 megahertz, uh, such as with the Murchison Wide Field Array, we're in the corona here and it pretty much it appears as a diffuse, um, a diffuse cloud, more or less. This isn't just due to the fact that we've lost spatial resolution 
um, due to the, the, the lower frequencies or longer wavelengths, this is an actual physical effect of scattering in the corona, washing out all that fine scale structure. That's actually a, a hot topic these days uh, in studying how turbulence relates to scattering and how that relates to large scale structure that we see with uh, low frequency interferometers such as MWA and LOFAR. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a, a flavor of how we use LOFAR and other instruments in the radio domain and some research highlights over you know, the past decade or so of you know, how we study eruptive activity, how we study shocks, particle propagation, the nature of turbulence in the corona. Um, and that was all used in combinations of uh, you know, low-far or low-frequency instrumentation with you know, previous space-based instrumentation such as Solar Dynamics Observatory and other EUV imagers. But what I'd like to discuss here now is you know, the, the next generation in space-based observing technology that has re recently been launched by NASA and ESA, and these are the Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter. So these are pretty popular missions these days. You may have heard of them before. So Parker Solar Probe was launched in 2018. It will undergo several orbits of the sun, each one closer than the last until it reaches a final perihelion distance of 9.9 .9 solar radii, which is outrageously close to the sun. We have Solar Orbiter, um, which was launched in 2020. Um, it will have several perihelia of the sun as well, not as close, but close enough at 0.28 astronomical units. Um, they carry on board a whole suite of instruments, both in situ and uh, remote observing. The remote observing they carry is you know, radio spectrometers, uh, white light imagers and in situ particle detectors and plasma detectors as well. So these spacecraft represent, you know, you know, the latest technology and, you know, new views of the heliosphere and spacecraft that will actually be in the corona offering in situ observing for the first time ever in coronal observing. Just to give you a view of the orbits of these things, hopefully this movie plays for you. We have a uh, solar orbiter in the red here. We have Parker Solar Probe in the green. And you can see it will undergo several orbits of the sun, uh, each one, as I said, closer than the last until it reaches about 9.9 .9 solar radii above the solar sur surface, pretty much being in the solar corona itself and the first spacecraft to be able to do so. Parker Solar Probe will undergo uh, several orbits as well. Um, it will fly out of the ecliptic and to a large inclination, pretty much providing um, similar observations, but from a different vantage point. So it's, it's fantastic to be able to have these two spacecraft in the heliosphere close to the sun at the same time. Now, we also recognize the fact that, you know, while we have these fantastic observational assets, you know, in the heliosphere, it's a great opportunity for coordinated observations with the low frequency array simultaneously for ground support of Parker Solar Probe and um, Solar Orbiter. And this is what we've been doing over the past number of years and going into the future. So what I, I show here in the red line is basically the distance of Parker Solar Probe from the sun over time, uh, starting from 2018 onwards into the future here, 2022 and beyond. So you can see it performs a number of perihelia and gets close and moves away over time. Now what we have been doing is pretty much uh, committing all LOFAR resources that we can uh, at the time of Parker Solar Probe perihelia and eventually for the Solar Orbiter perihelia. So for example, we observe um, from between two to four weeks during the perihelia, you know, performing solar imaging, interplanetary scintillation studies, Faraday rotation studies, ionospheric scintillation, the full array, you know, you name it, whatever we can do, we're doing with LOFAR to provide a means of, you know, providing support basically of this fantastic, in, in, fantastic instrument that we have on the ground. Um, that's able, able to perform imaging observations of the solar corona and probe particle and plasma densities and so on, and have this, these observational assets in situ in the solar atmosphere themselves, at the, in the solar atmosphere itself at the same time. So as about some of you may know, say again? About five minutes. Yes. I think that was the five minute warning. Yeah, okay, sorry, so five minute warning, okay. five minute warning, yeah. yeah. So as some of you may know, during Parker Solar Probe's first few perihelia, we didn't really observe that much eruptive, eruptive activity. Just very briefly, we observed a variety of different uh, noise storm radio sources, so type three radio bursts, 
observed by in situ and ground based spacecraft at the same time, or sorry, in situ spacecraft and ground based observing platforms at the same time. So, for example, PSP, stereo, and wind observed type 3 radio bursts, giving us the ability to triangulate their propagation into the solar corona. Um, at the same time, we're able to reconstruct where these particles escape the solar corona with low far here from 30 to 80 megahertz on open field structures. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of the, the kind of things we're able to do with such uh, space-based and ground-based observing platforms. Okay, so these are my last slides. And very briefly, I just wanna talk about the future of low far in terms of um, space weather and solar physics observing. So this is a, a design study known as LOFAR for Space Weather. It's a H2020 design study, and it aims to upgrade the entire system or design an upgrade to the entire system such that it routinely observes uh, everything in the heliosphere that we can, basically. And it has to do so while not interrupting all of the radio astronomy observations that are going on simultaneously. So this basically involves an upgrade to the front end um, antennas, the station electronics, central processing, all of the pipelines in between, pretty much carrying two data streams through the entire system. Uh, one in red here is the space weather data stream. The other one in blue will be the radio astronomy data stream, pretty much upgrading the entire system such that it's two uh, astronomical observing platforms in one. One will be space weather, one will be radio astronomy. Um, uh, you can find out more at lowfarforspaceweather.eu. Um, briefly, what do we hope to do? Well, pretty much everything that we can do with LOFAR in observing the heliosphere. So observing eruptive activity on the sun, uh, like in the, in, the, uh, in the science that I just showed, um, inter interplanetary scintillation of Faraday rotation studies of the heliosphere, hopefully offering you know, a means of getting a, a magnetic field in the heliosphere and ionospheric studies as well to see how the ionosphere responds to space weather activity. So there's a whole variety of things that we hope to be able to do with an upgrade uh, such as low far for space weather. And this is my last slide here, and I'll just leave it at this, just shows what I call the radio space weather research landscape. So there, are, there is a worldwide you know, distribution of instruments, both uh, dedicated and non-dedicated to observing the sun, okay? And these are in combination with the fact that we have a worldwide distribution of space weather operational centers indicated by the flags here. So in terms of the radio observing platforms, we of course have NONSE here, LOFAR for space weather, hopefully in the future, which will make part of an upgrade known as LOFAR 2.0. And we have ISCAT and Kyra observing the ionosphere. You know, in Russia, we have microwave imagers such as SSR, SSRT. And we have MUSER in China, IPS, um, observing platforms in Korea and Japan. Of course, no uh, radio talk is complete without mentioning the square kilometer array, which will be located in Western Australia and in South Africa. In the Americas, of course, we have ALMA, non-dedicated again, but you know can be used to observe the sun, and both dedicated and non-dedicated observing platforms in North America as well. So there's a whole you know worldwide range of observational assets for observing the phenomena I just talked about which means the future looks bright for solar and space weather um, observing technology. And um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Dr. Carly, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was incredibly interesting. We have um, time for questions now. And the first question is, um, I've seen a lot of mainstream news reporting of CMEs focusing on the doomsday scenario of technology being destroyed. Is the threat overblown or should we be worried? So a question about, <laughs> about the, 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 big, the big space weather event that will hit us. Um, do you think this is an overblown threat or should we be this well, worried? I don't think the threat overblown because it is overblown because it has happened before and technology both on the ground and space have, have seen interruptions to their operation because of space weather activity. I mean, in the modern day, one of the biggest events was, I guess, the Quebec solar storm where the Quebec power grid, which also interconnects into North America, was brought down for several hours because of the impact of a geomagnetic storm. And that caused, you know, economic damage. It caused damage to the power distribution system in northern Canada as well. So it can and does have real life consequences. And even back then, that was that solar storm 
that cause such a power out outage wasn't as big as it can get. I guess the biggest ever is the famous one going back uh, to, was it 1859, the Carrington event? Um, back then, it interrupted technology and caused all sorts of adverse effects, like interrupted communication across the Atlantic, telegraph technology, and, um, you know, if one of those large-scale eruptive events, the size of the Carrington event, happened nowadays, I mean, the, the calculation is it would cause huge amounts of economic damage and interruptions to technology both on the ground and in space. So I would say the doomsday scenarios, while they are, you know, not hugely likely, they can happen. And maybe it's safe to say it's only a matter of time before one of them does happen and causes large scale consequences. That, that's, that's really interesting. It's a hugely interesting topic, the, the effects of space weather on technology. And there's, there's basically, there's two different, I suppose, um, scenarios where this type of community can help out. One of them is the, the 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 engineering solutions where we effectively harden our equipment more and more, um, yeah. which obviously puts huge amounts of cost in terms of the launch of, of spacecraft and so on. If we're going to have to put a, a lot of uh, protection around the uh, components that we're putting up in space, but the other the other aspect is around the the forecasting, and within the UK, obviously, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of work gone on in the last ten years around space weather forecasting so the the question i had for you was um my understanding with the with the solar radio observations is that that that's not something that's applied directly to forecasting large events but is is there is there is there any sort of precursor or has that been looked at in terms of looking at the the radioactivity in the sun to see if there's anything there that um that would give us an indication that there's a there's a big event coming Okay, so there's 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 two things here. Um, the radio bursts themselves do not necessarily give a great indication of space weather forecasting. Like type two radio bursts may be an indicator of a CME or a shock leaving the corona, and can be used in some sense as you know a forecaster of the arrival time of that CME. But there is a large uncertainty on um, on that arrival time. So the radio bursts. I guess can aid in the in in the forecasting, but you know they're they're, they're not um, a key uh, observational aspect of forecasting. Now there is new means of observing um, the interplanetary medium through interplanetary scintillations, mm -hmm. and that gets you at being able to observe CMEs in the heliosphere. And there isn't many means of doing this on a routine basis right now. You know there are heliospheric imagers in the white light domain which could do this. Um, but the radio domain can provide scintillation um, of radio um, intensity, basically, observed, and that can be used to derive both density and velocity of the solar wind and the heliosphere. So that's one of the few means of, of, of observing CMEs on their entire journey from the sun to the earth. As well as this, there is research currently being done into Faraday rotation studies at the same time of you know, the radio light that is received. And that may be one of the few means of getting at the magnetic field in the heliosphere, and not only the magnetic field, but it's, its orientation and direction. And the orientation and direction and the strength of the magnetic field is ultimately what causes, or is, is a key indicator of how strong a geomagnetic storm will be. And if you know radio is the only technology that's able to give, give this, it will become an essential and integral component of space weather technology in the future. Now, I should say, you know, Faraday rotation studies and uh, diagnosing magnetic field in the heliosphere, I would say it's at the research stage, um, and it will eventually, in my view, reach the stage where it provides routine operational support to those space weather forecasters, and maybe even be a routine aspect of space weather operations, you know, in, in, in general. That sound, that's, really, that's a really interesting development, and I think that's something that is um is really needed because we are we, we're always very short of those observations in the medium between the the sun and the earth so that sounds to be an incredibly useful development if you can get at the magnetic field and um, we mm. have a question from uh, uh john morrell which is when observing the sun with the dish based radio arrays how do they get over the problem of the amount of solar heat reflected into the receivers so that's a practical question. Okay, so the, if the receivers are, are, are designed to observe the sun, the amount of power they receive can be handled by engineering design, I guess. 
But for a technology that's not meant to observe the sun, it's maybe meant to pick up pretty weak signals. Um, mm -hmm. so ALMA, for example, I think they have to implement special engineering solutions when they point it at the sun, taking into account uh, the, the, the intense power received in the radio domain and potentially um, the, the heat received at the same time. So I know um, there are, you know, retrofitted engineering solutions into technology and, and dishes that can be used when a radio telescope that's not meant for the sun is pointed. But for those that can, uh, or those that do observe the sun by des by design, you know, they can already they can already deal with that kind of thing, yeah, by design, yeah. And of course, low fire can, can do this. It has no moving parts in a sense, so um, it's 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 technology at the front end it doesn't need to be so sophisticated when we're observing any type of, of of radio observing source. Thank you. I think I don't know what the weather's like over there with you, but it, it's absolutely baking hot here. So I can imagine everybody's worried about any equipment they've got outside today and, and it, it getting overheated. Um, so we have um, another question here, which is um, said that uh, Owen mentioned something about machine learning. Um, could you give some details of what you're doing with machine learning in terms of radio observations of the sun? Sure. So the, the, the data rates that we received in, in, that we receive in a single station alone can be absolutely enormous. Like when we use our single station uh, on its own to observe the sun or to observe transients, and um, it can generate at about four terabytes per hour. So that's a huge torrent of data to have to be able to deal with. We can't store it all. You know, there, there isn't enough storage available to, to keep that running 24 seven and continuously. So what we try and do is take the data stream and um, basically plug it into a neural network and have the neural network decide whether it's good data or bad data. Mm -hmm. The good data being if there's if there's a transient in there, if there's a solar burst, or if if, if, there, if there was a pulsar picked up, you know that's good stuff. Let's save that at high resolution. Uh, otherwise, if there's nothing in our data stream, maybe downsample it and um, and pretty or indeed maybe throw it away because it's useless. The, um, the observing technology we need uh, is basically clusters of graphics processor units on which we train neural networks to be able to, um, you know, be able to detect automatically and in real time solar radio bursts. What that requires is thousands and thousands of examples of solar radio bursts. If you're into machine learning, it's mm -hmm. basically giving a computer thousands, if not millions of examples of something. So it learns a general rule and is able to um, recognize the next one. Um, the problem for us is we don't have that many labeled um, labeled um, examples of solar radio bursts, but we can generate them in simulations. So what we do is we generate tens of thousands of simulated examples of solar radio bursts, feed it into the neural network, and the neural network is then able to recognize them on the fly on our backend technology. And hopefully that will be rolled out at all stations. We're just giving you know, it's just a test bed on the Irish station at the moment. But machine learning may be an integral aspect of LOFAR or, for example, the SKA, given the huge data rates that they're going to generate, we're going to need to be able to decide what's good data and what's bad data and which data, which data to store at um, high resolution. Yeah, it's, that's, it's, that's a really interesting approach. I mean, I think that um, as we get more storage capacity, we just we just eat it up faster than we than we actually produce it. And I think that it's it can be really frustrating to think that we might lose valuable data from an exciting event. Um, sure. But I think that yeah, the the approach that you're saying of in terms of a basically pattern recognition and a buffer to store what's needed is. Um, is, is really the only way forward, I think. But it, it, it does always worry me that we could lose something really valuable without um, without having uh, having the control over over the data storage there. So that's it's good to know there's there's a there's a great approach. The next question we have here is um, is about data assimilation. Um, so has is the is the low far data being used in in real time data assimilation? Is it being used to inform models? Um, I, I mean, I'm guessing that so certainly sort of looking at past data, it's used in, in assimilative models in, in the research um, fields. But is it is it actually being planned to use it in real time? And would that be something that I guess would be um, picked up by all of the space weather forecasting agencies that there are around there? True. So um, low far data at the moment is it's, it's absolutely enormous when it's streaming into the central processing mm -hmm. facilities. 
it takes time to correlate. It can be correlated and, and then sent in real time to a, another algorithm that maybe wants to process it to produce imaging. Those imaging algorithms take some time to run because of the data size. And um, for example, we're testing as part of LOFAR for space whether right now, whether or not um, LOFAR can possibly image the sun in real time as the data streams in. It turns out it may be able to do so, yeah. So we may be able to, through parallel processing of our imaging algorithms, produce imaging of the sun, which can be available, I guess, within, <coughs> excuse me, within minutes of observation. At the moment right now, that is not implemented as part of the standard processing procedures of the system. It doesn't just acquire the data and here's your image. In fact, what we usually do is um, take the, the data days later, if not weeks, and process, mm -hmm. the, process slowly the images. But yes, it is part of the plan to have it in real time, it's particularly for space weather studies of the sun and the heliosphere, yeah. So I have um, a, a question which arose partly through the talk that I, I'd like to ask from, for myself, which is um, you showed that uh, when you got down to about 80 megahertz, you were getting significant scattering in the, in the corona. But yeah. the the low far system is um, is spec down to ten megahertz, so lower than that. Um, mm. What's what's the limit? Is there is there a point from your point of view, from what you're doing with low far for for the solar radio work, to go down below eighty megahertz? And and what what's your limit, I suppose, for that? And also thinking about the fact that obviously this is a an earth based system, um, and if we were looking at something that was a space based system, then what 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 sort of what's the lower frequency limit i guess would be my my question yeah so the the image that i showed it went from 17 to 80 megahertz but we can and do all the time actually observe from 80 to 10 megahertz in imaging with low far so that's you know that's kind of standard procedure at this stage and it offers offers us much the same images as you saw in that 80 megahertz images 80 mm -hmm. megahertz image we can study scattering we can study particle acceleration turbulence whatever whatever we want really in, in the plasma physics of the solar atmosphere. It's an interesting one. You mentioned, you know, the 10 megahertz, you know, after there you have to cut off because you can't observe anything from the ground with 10 megahertz because of the ionosphere. Uh, so you need to go to space-based observing platforms. Um, mm -hmm. And they offer you up until now pretty much just dynamic spectra, you know, radio bursts in the low frequency domain uh, out to kilohertz even, you know, but there mm -hmm. is, New design studies, and I think one's even being built um, by some, I think some design studies in NASA. I think the, the name of the mission may be known as Sunrise, which mm -hmm. is a flying, a formation flying interferometer in space, which will be able to produce localized um, radio burst observations. So, you know, you will do the same as you would as an interferometer on the ground. In other words, correlate all the signals, but these will be actually formation flying spacecraft, enabling you to do this uh, below that 10 megahertz cutoff. And that's being used, you know, to possibly localize type two radio bursts, much the same kind of thing as I, as I as I showed before, and and um, you know, escaping particle beams into into the solar system. And I think that mission is being designed and will be built in the next decade, I believe. Mm, that sounds really interesting. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions. The uh, we're coming to what to the end now, so we'll we'll do we'll do two more. The first one is um, uh, is there a capacity within your current system? to allow uh, trials of unsupervised alternate mach machine learning methods from the global community, uh, from things like uh, Kaggle Crowd Analytics Zindi Challenge events? Um, sure, um, especially for the single station operations. Um, we use it as a standalone station uh, every week. We get a couple of days observing for our own low fire station. And as a, a, the Irish LOFAR Consortium, it's up to us what we do with that as, as a platform for observing transients or whatever and machine learning. So if anyone had any ideas of using unsupervised machine learning as a means of sorting our data or you know looking at transients, they'd be more than welcome to get in touch and try it out on our, our computational backend. I should say we, we have recently built a large backend that consists of several uh, Dell PowerEd servers on which you know one could try machine learning experiments if you had some good ideas so 
yeah, I think we would welcome that for sure. Excellent. So that question was yeah. from, from uh, Rhys Wilkinson. So actually there's an invitation there to, to get in touch um, in future and to talk about that as a, a future project. Um, we're going to finish off now. We've got an excellent question to finish here, um, which I think lots of us would like to be asked for real, which is um, if you had an unlimited budget, what mission would you design to observe or predict space weather events? Oh, that's a good one. Maybe, you know, there, there is talk of radio observations being, taking place on the moon because, of, of course, you don't have to deal with the, the significant sources of RFI, which are, are growing every day, you know, on ground-based observing. You don't have to deal with that 10 megahertz cutoff. So, you know, it sounds a bit sci-fi, but a radio observing platform, a lunar radio observing platform would be a pretty nice one. Um, as well as this, more telescopes on the ground and solar dedicated ones. I mean, I mentioned that so far it's not a solar dedicated instrument um, it would be nice if we had such a powerful piece of technology that was used for space weather so unlimited budget yeah i would i would say a low far for space weather for one and then more space-based observing technology like the one uh, from from the states sun, the sunrise mission and potentially other uh, types of observing technology on on the moon as well so yeah, hopefully that will be a thing in the near future. That's a, that's a great answer to end with. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll finish there now. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Carly. It's been a really interesting question and answer session and an excellent presentation. So thank you so much for your contribution to the conference. No problem. My pleasure. <laughs>